My name is Michael Zaykovsky. I'm a PhD student with linguistics and applied linguistics program here at ASU. And you know what? Originally, I intended to begin this introduction with a personal anecdote of how the only thing that prevented me from burning, burning Michelle for cause the history of sexuality was uh, Mike Mana's series of YouTube videos about the book. However, <laughs> After digging a little deeper um, into our speaker's background, and I encourage you to check out his website and YouTube channel, my mind was blown by uh, his take on, among other things, imposter syndrome in academia. The interpretation I learned from Mr. Uh, Mena changed my perception of the concept 180 degrees. Let me read you the following, and this is a quote of our speaker's take on imposter syndrome versus imposter training. I had a difficult time in graduate school. On my best days, I felt average, but most days I felt on the verge of tears. I was told I have imposter syndrome. Those were not my words. Um, it's what I was told. I was trained to feel like an imposter. My imposter training was relentless, from explicit attacks to barely perceivable exclusions. But they added up uh, the tiny moments. They built, they built. Uh, eventually, all those tiny moments of feeling uh, had begun to make sense. I'm not as smart. I should quit. I want to go home. I knew each moment wasn't my fault, but I was told otherwise. I have imposter syndrome, but those were not my words. Never again, end quote. Um, I, you know, I personally always thought that a personal touch is something academia has been very reluctant to allow. However, we are beginning to see signs of change and more attention to our shared humanity. For these reasons, uh, it is Mr. Mr. Manon's role as a public academic, just one of the many hats that he wears that is especially dear to my heart. Yes, we need more and more research. We should constantly improve our teaching. However, what we are in urgent need of are people uh, who are translate and explain complex theories and concepts while acting as bridges between academia and the real world of human life and language, real world. It is an honor and a privilege to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming teacher, linguistic anthropologist, academic YouTuber, educational technologist, and public academic, uh, Mike Mena. Thank you so much for that introduction and that, um, that callback to some of my very old first videos that I ever made. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about how those videos uh, came about in, in just a little bit. So again, uh, welcome everyone to today's presentation, uh, what we're calling the future of language-related disciplines, theory, practice, and social media. So some quick things about myself. My name is Mike Mena, once again, PhD candidate of linguistic anthropology, and I look at race, language, and inequality in the context of higher education. So those are my formal credentials, so to speak, the, the, the elevator speech, in other words. But I think the real reason that I'm here today uh, is that I run every aspect of the YouTube channel named The Social Life of Language. Uh, this is, a, and we'll look at it in, in just a little bit. This is a language and race public education project where I cover singular peer-reviewed articles or chapters from academic books, and then translate them for a general audience, whatever that is. Uh, so this means taking a, taking a high-level text and then translating it into everyday language, um, and, or specifically a method that I call pedagogical transposition, uh, which is kind of at the heart of today's talk, although we'll be getting to that much later. Um, it's kind of like a, that part will be like a guide to transferring academic texts into accessible content, whether it be written accessible content or video accessible content. Um, it's a method that I think can be extracted to a lot of things. Um, but also at times, I think what also makes me really qualified to do this 
is that I'm also a public or a former public high school teacher. So my pedagogy is 101% inspired by that experience as a high school teacher. That means every time that I turn on uh, a camera or I press record somewhere uh, or make a piece of media for somebody somewhere else, it almost always requires that I transform into that high school teacher persona that I developed uh, 10 years ago with teenagers. That's just the way that I get in front of people now. I just, that's, that, that's just what comes out now. And if any of y'all are familiar with teaching in public schools, then you know that it's very difficult to keep the attention span of teenagers, uh, even for five minutes or 10 minutes, right? Um, you almost feel like it's your job to be entertaining. Uh, although nowadays we call that being engaging or creating engaging content, right? But to me, it's two sides of the same coin. Entertainment and engagement are very related concepts. Now, over the years of public school teaching, I learned something quite profound, but also quite basic. It's gonna be kind of like one of those duh types of moments, but uh, kids like having fun when they learn, right? That seems obvious. Um, when I started making these videos for undergrads, um, which is where, where my initial audience was, I'm gonna make these explainer videos, these interpretation videos for undergrads. Um, I realized that undergrads also like having fun too. They also uh, like to have fun while they're learning, just like high school students. And then I started getting messages from master's level students. And uh, those types of messages sounded like, wow, that was really dense material and you made it so easy. Or I'm glad I found your stuff because in class, I would get so bored that I would just stop paying attention, right? So all of those messages started coming in. And then messages from faculty members started coming in to me as well, saying very similar things like, wow, I didn't understand that. Um, I'm gonna use this with my students. And then at the same time, high school students started contacting me to say, hey, I really liked your video on so-and-so, right? So there's some kind of very broad appeal that my videos can be used with high school students, but can also be used in doctoral level programs, um, which made me start theorizing about what I am doing and why it has become so effective over the last couple of years. Uh, I wanted to try to systematize what I was doing so that other people can replicate it and kind of make their own material as well. Um, so I, I've also began theorizing why my videos have become so successful up to this point. As of right now, my videos have something like 200,000 views um, in total, which is, which when you consider that this is a very niche topic, it's the intersection of race and language, or rather it's racism and the processes of racialization paired with the conceptual and contextual emergence of the thing we call language, capital L language. That is where I fall into. That is like my little mini umbrella. Um, considering how specialty of a, of a niche that is, I'm really surprised at how fast these videos have gotten popular. And on top of that, I talk about racism half the time. Racism is not exactly a popular topic to approach in the United States in general, anywhere, right? Um, but there's something very surprising there that for whatever reason, people are getting really into these videos. And I think it's just, it's because nothing is coming off condescending. Um, and I'm taking the audience very seriously as if they were sitting in a, in a college class with me, despite what age they are. The inspiration to the YouTube channel itself uh, was very simple. I wanted to learn from teachers that prioritized the experience of learning, more so than the content, the experience of learning that would help connect 
to me as a person, at a personal level, as a, at a cultural level, I wanted some kind of connection with my teacher. I identified as Mexican American. I came from Mexican filled schools. I went to an Hispanic serving institution. Um, I was surrounded by my people, so to speak. And then I came to New York uh, for a doctoral program. And unfortunately, that is not what I experienced in New York at, at all, at all. I was positioned, I positioned myself and was also positioned as not ready. Other people positioned me as not ready to be in a doctoral program. But looking back, it's not that I wasn't ready. It's that most of my teachers could not connect with me. They just could not speak to me in a way that I could hear them. And most of it was on linguistic grounds, that linguistic academic, um, linguistic academic register that was, that I just was not ready for. Um, I, what I found myself doing was going to class, not understanding what was going on. I found myself looking for videos on YouTube or whatever after class, but all I ever found was really ugly looking videos um, in lecture halls with like a camera set up way, way in the back of a lecture hall um, in Princeton or in Harvard. And you could barely hear anything. You could never hear the questions. The audio was terrible. It was all bad, right? And then on top of that, it was in the exact same language that I already did not understand in class. It was the same exact thing. Uh, so essentially it was like, I would go to class, listen to a lecture about Foucault, not understand it, go home, look up videos on Foucault's and also not understand it. And that was a really dangerous experience for me personally because I wanted to quit grad school because I had no resources. I had nobody to just show me like, what, what does he mean when he says these like very basic sounding vocabulary words, but, be, but in the theory of Foucault, they are not basic vocabulary words. They're often wrapped in all of this other huge web of theory. And it just felt too hard, too hard. Now, from being a former high school teacher, I already knew that when I taught material to other people, to my students, I felt like I understood things much better. So like the side effect of teaching people, I would accidentally like teach myself something and really, really understand things myself when I taught other people. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna make videos on Foucault and I'm gonna make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, just the way I would if I was forced to teach Foucault to high school students. Uh, I'm not gonna assume that they have already had classes on Foucault or that they've already had philosophy courses or that they have advanced degrees in philosophy. I'm gonna teach in my voice, just like me, just the way I would teach it to marginalized and racialized students who are not necessarily comfortable in speaking with academic language with the academic register. And so I did. I covered one of Foucault's books, chapter by chapter, keyword by keyword. And the videos overall pretty much exploded. Um, from that point, I was suddenly positioned as a specialist on Foucault. And I was invited to talk to classes. All, all these grad courses wanted me to come in. Hey, Mike, can you come and explain this stuff about Foucault? My students aren't understanding, you do it better, blah, blah, blah. So I found myself in this position of being positioned as some kind of like Foucaultian expert when literally like two months prior, I was, a, I was fantasizing about dropping out of school because it was just too hard, right? Um, granted, being positioned as an expert, as a PhD student, very, very junior PhD student, um, that brought along its, its own problems. But more importantly, it affirmed to me that it wasn't the actual material that was too hard. It was the fact that I felt alienated by the pedagogy, 
the classroom experience specifically. I specifically felt alienated by the academic linguistic register. That was the problem for me. That was my barrier. I also didn't like the way researchers often presented information in this like radically abstract level, completely outside of context, right? Um, which also had the effect of positioning the professor or the teacher as themselves outside of context. Um, as in, they presented themselves as objective researchers, objective presenters of knowledge, right? But some of my favorite parts of the academy um, and, and of being in the academy is the drama between academics. Like I'm talking the infighting, the gossip, like the publishing, the one guy publishes an article, then this other guy publishes, publishes an article against them and they go back and forth and, you know, other people get in and it's almost like a little, you know, rumble between academics. I find those things so fascinating. It's not necessarily because I like gossip, but it's because it showed me that actually, you know what, academics are kind of regular people. Like they're regular people, they get their feelings hurt. They want to have the last word. They're willing to publicly, you know, go after fellow academics, whether it's professionally or not. And, and a lot of, and all of it is wrapped in very professional language, right? But, but you, can, you, can, you can feel the annoyance and the anger in there. And I thought that was so fascinating knowing that academics themselves do not exist outside of um, outside of context. They they don't they don't exist autonomously and wholly separate from society just to teach me. They have their own biases. They have things that they don't like. They have other academics that they do, that they don't like either. Um, and that's what I wanted. I wanted somebody real. I wanted somebody to connect to me on a real level. I wanted somebody to say. Hey, Mike, you know what? This article is really boring, but it's really important and you need to learn it. And I'll tell you why afterwards, just focus on it. I know it's, I know it's hard. I know it's, I know you'll struggle to get through it, but it's really important. And we'll talk about it later. If somebody were to just tell me that it would have helped the experience of engaging in text so much easier for me. I needed somebody to tell me as both as an academic, as a young academic, but also as a real person, I needed that connection there. So I wanted to show you um, first about seven minutes of a video covering a seminal text in linguistic anthropology and in also a lot of other disciplines, a lot of social theory disciplines, humanities. It covers a little old book uh, by philosopher J.L. Austin uh, called How to Do Things with Words on the topic of performatives or performative language. One of the most important texts in language philosophy of our times, no doubt, uh, pretty much standard reading for many, many disciplines. Um, so, and anytime you hear the word performative uh, or stuff alluding to language performing action, a lot of times it links right back to J.L. Austin. Even people like Judith Butler have revamped J.L. Austin's work as well, right? J.L. Austin's theory is in the background of a lot of language theory. It's there. Um, but there's a problem. There is a big problem with this text. This book, uh, or the text, is based off written lectures delivered at Harvard in the 1950s. It reads like a lecture delivered at Harvard in the 1950s. It is dense, it is boring. It has about 20, 30 keywords, 30 categories presented throughout the book. It is super dense. At the same time, this book changed everything for me. I know that this book was totally formative to me as a theorist. Um, one of my favorite books of all time. But how do I take a text that's written in the 1950s by a white dude in Harvard, how do I make that text relevant to students in the 2020s? And that's what I try to do here. Let's watch and see how I do it. 
then this is kind of also an introduction to those who have never seen my work before. This is generally what you can expect to see from it. Let me pull up a share screen. If we can double check that everybody's muted as well. I think uh, Derek Keith might be. And yeah, I think everybody else is muted. Okay, so this is J.O. Austin. And we're only going to watch about six minutes, I believe. And this is me bringing a work from the 1950s into the 2020s. All right. So am I not muted? Yes, I'm not muted. Cool. Can you hear me? Yes. Thumbs up. Yeah. OK, so this, by the way, if you have any questions, please type them in. Um, it can be as complex or as simple as you might think that they are. A lot of times, the most simple, simple questions are actually the ones that are the most complex to answer. Um, if you're worried about anything, uh, do chime in and we'll get come back to the questions at the end. Um, okay, so this is how I bring something written in the 1950s to the 2020s, right? And I follow three pedagogical principles that I use to make my videos accessible. Those principles we will cover in depth a little bit later on today. Um, but it's taken me several years to really develop these principles in combination with my experience as a high school teacher. Um, but today, I'm just going to tell you the three guiding principles, because that's what you're here for. Um, but I started thinking I've also started thinking a lot about how I've been able to do social media for such a long time, because this is a very long and extended project. This is going on four or five years at this point. Um, how have I made it to, how have I lasted this long? Because social media is exhausting. And a lot of times it is a very terrible place to be. Um, I've gotten really ugly attacks over the last few years. Um, I've been told I've I've been told I'm a disgrace to legitimate anthropological research. That's a quote, quote quote right there. I've been told you're a reverse racist. Quote. You're racist against white people. Quote. You're racist against Europeans. Quote. One person said, "Please remove the Christmas lights from the back. It makes your videos completely inaccessible." That's a quote right there. Just this week. Somebody said, please remove your jokes. They are not funny and it takes me out of it. Your videos would be much funnier. I mean, your videos would be much better without jokes. See, there's, there's, there's gonna be people complaining about everything, right? Um, all of these, oh, and, and then on top of that, 100%, I'm not exaggerating here, 100% of all the negative comments that I've ever gotten all of them, judging from their names and their pictures and their social media profiles, 100% of them come from older white men. That can't be a coincidence after like 30 or 40, 50 times. It's only older white men that for some reason just have very serious problems with this kind of media. I don't know why. Um, so this, so obviously this is negative. This is a negative experience, a negative part of being a public persona. Um, but also it says something uh, very interesting, but indirectly. Um, it says that maybe having an academic voice on a huge platform like Twitter or Facebook, or in my case, YouTube, um, Instagram now has those extended videos now that um, academics are starting to put up there too. Um, maybe indirectly, this is an acknowledgement of how dangerous public education is to people like them, like those people that just absolutely hate my work. Maybe that's a hint. Maybe it's a hint that this kind of public education is very dangerous to things like racism or things like right-wing ideology. Because if we're being real for the moment here, what makes right-wing ideology so powerful is that 
these people know how to do public education the right way, as in the right wing way. They are so good at it already. They are way ahead of us. That is for sure. Um, we are in dangerous times. Um, and this is all the more reason why academics should take social media and public activism and public education more seriously. Now, I'm not saying become demagogues for your discipline. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but becoming public figures, um, I think it's important that we get out there. We, we are willing to take some risk um, in the effort to teach people how to think critically. Um, and an important aspect of getting people on your side or calling people in to listen to you, I would say one of the first steps is not alienating your knowledge, your, your audience with big specialized jargon. That is alienating to a lot of people who are not sitting in a room like this, right? And at minimum, right-wing media already knows this, already knows academic jargon is alienating. They already tapped into that a long time ago. Now, admittedly, this puts, us, this put, this puts a lot of us in a very difficult position here. How do I explain academic concepts of my discipline without using the academic terminology of my discipline? That part's hard. That part takes a massive amount of creativity. Um, but this is why I call my approach transposition as opposed to translation. I do not use the word translation because the word translation just assumes something will be lost in translation. That stuff will need to be dumbed down or need to be simplified. Right. I do not believe this. And all of my videos do not dumb things down. None of them. But I transpose every single video as opposed to translate. Um, so that leaves it to us as educators. We have to make decisions as educators about important, how important a particular piece of terminology is, or, or, or a very like specialist word or phrase. For example, how important is it for a student to memorize the keywords infelicitous performative, performatives versus felicitous for performatives? Or is it just more important that they know how performatives function in the world? Or maybe we can just call them happy versus unhappy, or even better yet, why don't we just use smiley, smiley face emojis and a sad face emoji like the way I did in my video? I don't think that takes away anything. When the student knows how the performative works, the, the fact that I use emojis is kind of beside the point. If they can go into the classroom and explain how, how when and where a performative is happy or unhappy, that's the important part. So today, like I said, I'm gonna give you my three guiding principles to making video essays out of academic texts. However, these, these three guiding principles can be applied to any kind of educational content that you want to make, that you want to make and you expect for it to be consumed by a general audience. And a big part of this is establish, establishing relevance to the lives of your audience members, or, for, or in our cases, to the lives of your students. Now, up next, I wanna show you a shorter clip. It's about five minutes long. And I wanna show you how I would assign one of my videos. All my videos are designed to be viewed before reading the actual text, so before. So you put this on, a, you really put this on a syllabus, you tell the student, watch the video first, then, then read the article. So students watch the video, then hopefully they are ready and they are excited to engage with the real text. Now the next video is uh, on an article from Language and Society. This is a very high level, prestigious journal, 
It is weighed down by academic jargon, just like any other typical kind of journal, journal article. It covers semiotic practices such as indexicality and in, in registerment. Um, and if you're even vague, vaguely familiar with semiotics, then you know that it has its own whole system of language, its, old, its own terminology. And often those terms are dependent on other specialist terms to understand. In other words, if you want to understand in registerment, you, you kind of have to know what indexicality is. And to know indexicality, you kind of got to be familiar with iconization and erasure and recursivity and chronotopic figures of personhood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this whole constellation of terms emerge trying to uh, explain what you're doing theoretically in the academic jargon. So the trick is, the real challenge to making these videos is, can I do it without using any of those words? None of them. And the way I get around it is by using media examples, by narrowing down the terminology to the one that I absolutely think I want to, I, I think there's no way to not talk about this one piece, one, one term. I'll usually narrow it down to one term only. And I don't try to summarize articles. I am not in the business of creating overviews or summaries. I'm going as deep as I can into specific examples. That way, when students read the original text, they can emulate my approach to understanding more examples from within the text itself or they have seen an illustration of the processes underneath without me actually saying words like fractal recursivity or metapragmatic, metapragmatic matic regimentation or whatever. They have seen the process through the examples as opposed to through the terminology. And most importantly, I'm not assuming stuff is going to be lost in translation just because I can't use the jargon of the article. In fact, I would say I have an advantage. I can use pictures. I can use videos. I can use emojis. I can use contemporary examples from the news, from straight from popular media. I can use the tone of my voice. I can use pan gestures, all of these ways of layering extra meaning that the, that the text on its own cannot do. This is partly why I can make a 1950s article fun in 2020. So let's watch about five minutes of this next, uh, of this next little excerpt. And let's see, it has to do with whiteness and language. And again, if you have any questions, please type them in. Uh, we will we will get to them at the very end. Uh, here we go. Here it is. We're going to watch about five minutes, and then we'll come back and continue. So that that was a video on mock white girl talk, um, which. There are plenty of examples of mock white girl talk all over the internet, but the part that is skipped is the process, the processes by which it, they emerge and are disseminated. That's actually where the fun part is, because you can really only get so much pleasure out of seeing like this person getting made fun of over here and this person getting made fun of over here. I would argue that where people have the most fun is seeing the story or the biography of the vocal fry effect itself. Um, so that's where I tend to create the interest inside of my videos. So I've made about 100 videos like this. Some are public, some are private, some I only use for presentations, uh, workshops like this one. Um, it's essentially a huge personal video library and it took a lot of time to create it. Uh, and that gets us to a really serious problem as academics, time. We don't have time. 
we don't have time to spend hours and hours and hours and hours producing and researching for these videos. Um, you know, academics are always short on time. They're always working with overlapping deadlines. Um, however, from here, I want to talk career stuff, um, moving into the future of higher education and kind of making the case to you that maybe this is a worthwhile uh, place to invest time moving into the future. Um, because honestly, uh, this is all well and good. And yeah, it's true. We're teaching the public and you know that's the Lord's work and things like that. It's, but you're not going to be getting paid for this for like a very long time. Um, so you won't see any monetary incentive for a while when you're just barely getting started off in doing any form of public education content. But I want to talk about some of the side benefits from doing this type of public education work. Because sure, it's easy to send out a few videos or, or record a few videos or send out a few tweets or whatever, but public engagement is utterly exhausting. And feeling good, feeling good about what you're doing in public um, in terms of public education will really only take you so far. Um, so how are you supposed to make this sustainable, this public education project sustainable over a lot of years? That is a serious problem that I think a lot of people, or the reason why a lot of people try it for two or three months and then just kind of quit. Um, but make no mistake, there is some serious potential to making some serious money off of this kind of stuff. And if it's not money, money, it's academic capital, or it, it feeds into your reputation as some sort of scholar. Like I said, you know, with those first videos, all of a sudden I was positioned as this Foucauldian specialist out of nowhere. I had no idea what I was doing, but somehow that's how I was positioned. Um, so I wanna talk career stuff for a few minutes. As a result of YouTube, I have gotten some pretty big grants and fellowships, including one for about $28,000 uh, from the Carnegie Foundation for being a educational technologist is what they called it. Um, it was directly related to the YouTube channel. Um, what's kind of funny though, is that I'm, I'm kind of not very good at technology, like I can work the most complex video, audio, software, editing tools in the world. But if you really want to mess me up, you just tell me to try to send money on Venmo because there I'll be, I'll, I'll be stuck staring at my phone. I can barely even remember the password to get into my phone. Don't even ask me to send money through Venmo. It's not going to happen. I also want to wait for like 30 minutes while I try to get my life together. So it's interesting that I was hired as an educational technologist, but I'm actually not good at technology. Really, what we're doing here um, is we're learning a, yes, a techn technological skill, but the skill is producing accessible educational content. The skill is not becoming a computer wizard. That is like a secondary effect that comes through the process, but it's not required. So if you're worried about, you know, your technological literacy or illiteracy, I would say that's not actually a, as big of, of a problem as you might think it is. Um, there is a gaping wide hole for this type of educational content. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people who do it. There's a lot of educational content out there, but there aren't many who prioritize accessibility. And there aren't many that prioritize uh, material written by and for the academy. Like there's a lot of pop cultural type analysis, which are good. Those are their own thing. It's not at, 
I, I wish it was deeper. I wish it would get to a higher level to really, really dig into the social processes. There's a lot of examples about, about mock white girl language and vocal fry and gendered performances of languages. Tons of examples and explanations about what it is, but you have nothing in terms of theoretical approaches to why society creates things like mock white girl. That is where the gap is. There's nothing there. It's one of the thing is it's one thing to identify examples. It's another thing to explain the social processes through which such examples emerge. And also just to encourage the audience to do their own kinds of social analysis. Um, and, this, and this is kind of where I position myself, or at least have been positioned as an explainer of social processes. Um, and I would suggest the social process is where the fun is, not the examples. It's the social processes. That, that is the interesting stuff that'll get people to come back more and more from more videos over and over and over again. And then back to career stuff. I wanna talk about the recent displacement of the traditional academic conference, particularly during this continuation or afterlife of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? It's not the same. Um, I'm sure many of you here have attended a, a, a remote academic conference over the last couple of years. Uh, they're not super fun. I think they're way too long. I think they're tiring. Um, and it's because they're trying to emulate the real life conference experience, but on a computer. So instead of tailoring the academic conference um, to the digital experience, uh, they're doing something else when I think they should be really focusing on making the conferences faster and expect shorter attention spans because that's the way we consume media. That's the way we sit at a computer. This is why, in my opinion, we can't just record ourselves saying our lectures to a webcam and tell students to watch it and expect any sort of amazing effects from it. It's just not the same as watching a person talk in real life. It needs to be, it needs to, something else, it needs more to replace the real life classroom experience. Lectures need to be tailored to be consumed online, where there is a different set of normative behaviors, of normative ways of consuming knowledge. So when it comes to digital teaching um, and digital public education, I think it means that we need to rethink the category lecture. We need to rethink what a lecture is when it comes to being online. Because I strongly believe that if we want our material to call people in, to be inspiring to people, to make them want to learn, the lecture format is not going to work. Something else is needed, which is what I've been working on, the something else. We also got to acknowledge, though, that the benefits of digital conferences and public talks um, there are some benefits. I've gotten to see, you know, some superstars that I would have never gotten to see. Some of my personal academic heroes, right? Um, I probably would have never seen them in real life. Um, however, for junior scholars, I'm not sure much has changed in the way that we disseminate research in our field, except that maybe junior scholars are more disadvantaged, more disadvantaged. Traditionally, we show up to a conference and we talk to a room full of people. At least that's the way we imagine conferences to go, right? We're gonna show up and we're gonna talk to a whole bunch of people in our rooms. Um, when we're junior scholars, uh, you know, we kind of have a different experience in that we tend to talk to empty rooms. And the only thing that feels worse than speaking to an empty room in real life is speaking to an empty room on Zoom, 
right? Or how about speaking on a Saturday morning at a conference when everyone just went out to the local bars the Friday night, right? How about being a brand new scholar and also talking on Saturday morning and nobody knows who you are? In reality, a lot of times at conferences, you talk to 10 people at a time, five of those people are on the panel with you, right? We should consider how much that experience costs on your wallet, like actual like monetary cost. Undergraduates don't really go to conferences because, well, how much does it cost to get there, right? Probably $500 for a plane ticket, probably another $500 for a few nights at a hotel. Don't forget the $200 uh, registration fee, right? Essentially, you're paying to talk to 10 people and to purchase a line for your CV. On top of that, these conferences aren't even attended by the general public, right? You can make, you can make the argument that conferences are for academics to disseminate uh, their work to other academics. Perhaps that is a legitimate argument, um, but this is just assuming undergrads or the general public wouldn't like to attend our conferences. And really just paying $100 to register um, is just out of the question for so many undergrad students whose families don't have that kind of money to pay $100 registration fee. So to me, academic conferences are not public events. They are highly private academic events. So let's contrast creating an audience on a platform like YouTube and even another video platform like Instagram um, where you could create extended video now. Now, pre-pandemic, I did the conference tours just like everybody else when the pandemic when the pandemic hit. I knew that you know conference tours are probably gonna gonna or conferences are probably just gonna not happen as often, right? So I decided to do videos on my own publications. So when the pandemic hit, um, I knew I wasn't gonna be speaking to the public. Uh, for me, uh, so, so what I decided was just like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna make videos on my own stuff, on my own uh, material, my own publications or whatever. And, and so I did. And in that first video, I got 500 views within the span of a couple hours, right? Um, in, all serious, in all seriousness, how many conferences does one have to speak at to get to speak to a total of 500 people. Uh, I, I imagine it could take a very long time, many years, especially if you are an unknown scholar, right? That's a pretty big jump from, from speaking to five to 10 people to speaking to 500 people on YouTube. Um, yet somehow conferences continue to be the primary ways to disseminate your work uh, to the academy. Now, I can tell you that my videos on my publications specifically have already accumulated over 5,000 views in the span of a couple of years. Now, from the analytics that YouTube provides me, I can see that my videos are assigned to about five or six courses every single week. Uh, it kind of just tells me that on YouTube. It tells me like, oh, there's a spike of like 50, 60 views within like the span of two hours right? Um, that doesn't just randomly happen that 50 or 60 people from the same state uh, find my videos at the same time. Um, so, and then also faculty members have also started sending me their syllabi to show me how they use my videos. It's not just my teaching style. It's because public educational content dealing specifically with theories of language and society don't really exist. So they, ha they almost have to assign my stuff because there isn't anything else. But that's good for people like us, people that are sitting in this room. There is an audience there just waiting for you to walk in and take over. The audience is ready-made and all you gotta do is press record and start making your own stuff. There is an audience there. Now, because of these videos, I've also been invited to speak on a bunch of podcasts, uh, published in books, published in journals. Um, I've been 
offered postdocs. Um, like I said, I've gotten a lot of little grants, a lot of big grants between 500, 1,000, 2,500, $4,000. Uh, all to help me do what I do. But perhaps the most important part of all of that, besides the money, is the academic capital that has accrued from the channel itself. I don't know exactly um, I, I, what I was just saying earlier. I didn't know who recommended me to speak here to ASU. I couldn't tell you. I didn't ask anyone to to hook me up, the email just showed up in my, in, in my inbox, just like the way it always does. And a couple of weeks ago, it was Columbia University, uh, University of London, Dallas IS, ISD. In this sense, social media not, has not only afforded a public platform, but it also gave me a platform within the language-related disciplines themselves, which can be very powerful for a junior scholar. You can almost skip the conference circuits if you wanted to or if you wanted to try that. Now, don't misconstrue that with uh, don't ever do conferences because I do do conferences, but now I'm much more selective about what I do and what I don't do. Now, I should also put my YouTuber subscriber count in perspective. I have 4,860 4, subscribers right now. That is technically a tiny channel on YouTube. That's tiny in the sense that normal people have 50,000 subscribers or 500,000 or 5 million subscribers, right? However, let's think of 4,600 subscribers as my subscribers as people mostly within the disciplines of linguistic anthropology, sociolinguistics, and linguistics. In that sense, even if just 100 of those people are active faculty members are active uh, or are writing right now, they're actively pub uh, publishing. That hundred people are the people that are assigning my work in their classes or citing me in their journal articles. Um, all of that just from YouTube. So if we remember that 4,800 people is actually a very concentrated audience affiliated with specifically with my disciplines, it's no wonder the academic capital has accumulated in such a potent form so quickly, despite the fact that I have a technically small subscriber count. All of that is to say that social media can be used as a public education project, but it can also become a potent form of capital for you, for your career. Um, it can spread your work widely, quickly, especially if we're comparing it to the way we normally disseminate our work, which is through journals and journal search engines and speaking to those five, 10 people at a time at conferences. Um, this is probably the reason why I've been able to do um, academic YouTubing for so long. The good feelings are nice. I like that I help people. I like that I help students. Um, but it's a lot of work. And I don't know if I would have gone this far if I hadn't started getting all of these grants and all these invitations and all of these you know, extra side benefits. So there's real academic capital to accumulate here. Um, just recently, I was invited to come out on an NPR, NPR podcast. Last year, I gave my first keynote address. A keynote address for someone that does not have a PhD yet, that, that is unusual. So recognizing my responsibility as a public figure now, this is why I now make it a point to make sure that I cover publications from scholars of color. So I dedicate half of my content to scholars of color. And that's just a decision that I made, um, especially because a lot of research on language doesn't pay attention to race a lot of times. It's still a problem. Okay, so up next, uh, we're going to watch uh, a longer video, and this one is going to be specifically on the transposition pedagogy, or the movement from academic text to public educational content. Um, so keep in mind that this is technically for video makers, 
but it can be applied to any kind of material written to be consumed by a general audience. Um, in fact, I've been invited to collaborate on this big project where we're going to use this transposition uh, pedagogy. Hopefully like that comes out within this, this year, but I'm thinking next year. Um, so importantly, uh, like I said, I don't think video lectures, video lectures in the traditional sense are gonna be the way of the future. So I'm going to propose we move towards something I call a creative video essay. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll kind of get the gist of it. I'll be sending out this link to everybody in an email afterwards, with, uh, along with some other resources that you can also look at. Um, but this is more or less the pedagogical method that I use with every single one of my videos, which I think has been pretty successful up to this point. Now, if you want to uh, turn your camera off and get a snack, now would be the time to do it. All right, here we go. And if I can get a thumbs up when it, when it starts playing, I will see you guys right after it's done and play. Okay, so that was the, that was the gist of transposition. Um, video essays, uh, quite different from video lectures. And I don't think they're totally hard to make just as long as you follow these simple principles, right? Which is don't assume your audience has done any homework for you. That's an easy one. Um, focus on one or two keywords, just one or two, and then that's it. Just the one or the two, and then go as deep as you can into those one or two. And we're not translating material downward or simplifying, we're transposing, which means you got to get a little bit creative in how you do it. And that also means we're not overviewing, we're not summarizing, we're aiming for depth. Because honestly, if I had to bet money, I am pretty sure students really don't actually like overviews. I, I just, I have this feeling that they just, they don't. Uh, I could be wrong, but there it is. Well, that is all for my presentation today. It has been an absolute pleasure talking with everybody here. Um, afterwards, I'm gonna send everybody a link um, to a whole bunch of other videos that I have that are on private. Um, it's on a whole bunch of different topics like how to set up your camera, what to put in your background, um, how to develop an on-screen persona, which is also relevant to how to, how to uh, develop like a podcaster persona. Um, so I think there's about six or seven uh, videos that are not open to the public um, that you all will get to have and watch when, if you want to. And of course, you'll get this video too in the email. Um, and um, yeah, it's been great. It has been great. Let's look for any questions now that we have like, oh, we've got a little bit of time left. See if we have any questions. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. It has been my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. It's been our pleasure. And while um, our audience uh, not thinking about their questions and uh, you know putting their questions in the chat box, I would like to read it a couple of complimentary remarks from, um, from the audience. Uh, at the very beginning uh, of the lecture, Loren said that, wow, thank you for naming that. Unfortunately, I didn't catch which uh, phenomenon you were talking about in particular. I just realized that this, I didn't catch. Loren definitely caught it. <laughs> uh, thanks for naming that. I just re realized that this is what I've been uh, talking about um, uh, uh, doing my writing for early language and literacy. Mm. Uh, then Vanessa said that, wow, you're explaining the exact same experience I faced uh, in the PhD as a Latina uh, student. And uh, we uh, have remarks from, and we have questions actually. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and one more from uh, 
Cindy starts through, so, so, and she says that thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, and she had to go early, but also she mentioned that uh, thank you for surviving, for surviving the negative feedback to continue to teach us. Yes, because it was especially, you know, yeah. you know, it was intense. <laughs> those, those weird times. people out there, weird people. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so the questions, Iqbal uh, asks, uh, can virtual uh, transposition method be the trend in the pedagogical world in the future? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you some vague details on a project that I'm working on that is uh, currently in the works of getting funded. Um, the idea is to take 10 articles from linguistic anthropology, get 10, uh, to take, get the 10 original authors and transpose one of their articles into a three pager meant for high school con consumption. Uh, so my job is, I, I'm not totally sure what my job is except other, other than doing the transposing uh, workshop and trying to help people along of like, I think high school students would connect to this or, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, try rephrasing this in a certain way, or let's uh, too many big words here, or I might get lost here. Um, so yeah, I definitely do think that uh, this thing that I'm calling transposition is, um, I, I think it could be catchy if people do indeed, you know, catch on to it. Because another way I explain it, um, aside from the musical key idea is imagine that you have a song that you want to play, but you have to switch out the instruments. So you take the guitar away and then you give them a flute, you know, play, play all the same notes, but it's a flute. How are you? And the flute is what the high school student likes to hear. Like that is their favorite instrument. So you have to learn how to play what you're normally used to playing on a guitar. You got to learn how to play it on the flute. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, um, I think it'll catch on. I, well, I mean, at least I, I, I hope so. It wasn't really one of my dreams or anything. It just so happened that oh, through all of these years and putting together, okay, this doesn't work. This definitely works. When my mom, I'll give you an example. My mom the other day, not the other day, this last year, she sent a Christmas letter where she dropped the phrase semiotic affordances. Just out of nowhere, in her Christmas letter, she's like, "Oh, and we were gifted with the with the with the semiotic affordances of so and so and so." Right? If my mom understands my work, I feel like I'm doing a good job. You know, she's a nurse. She, she's a nurse. She is not a semiotician. She's not a linguist. <laughs> you know, she she hasn't been she hasn't been in college in like 10, 15 years. Um, but if my mom can know or incorrectly use what the, the, the phrase semiotic affordance, I think that says a lot about the pedagogy itself. There's some, there, I'm doing something right here. And eventually if I could meet up with other educators that would like to expand upon it and maybe even make the method even better, that would be great. Unfortunately, there's just not that many people who, who do what I do in the digital world yet, or at least the way that I do it. But yeah, I, I'm I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that it that that it becomes a, a bigger thing in the future. I think it could. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, Robert asks, um, is repeatedly cutting out sections of the video intended to move it along more quickly, and does that uh, take a lot of time to edit? Yes. So this is one of these things where you have to be highly conscious of how students and the public consume media. I could leave all of the silences between all of my word, all of my sentences, right? But if, if you noticed, I probably cut out every single breath, Mark. There is absolutely, there's like zero silences anywhere in there, right? That's not, that's not solely my stylistic choice. That is me being conscious of the way YouTube looks. That platform looks a certain way. 
So I emulate the aesthetics and the style of that platform because I know it works there. And when somebody gets on YouTube, that's what they're expecting. That that's what they want, in other words, or at least that's what I'm assuming they want. Um, be, and that's why I also kind of question whether or not lectures that are recorded with like, let's say a webcam where, where the professor's kind of talking like this and then they pause and then they reorient themselves and start talking again. And then they pause, like, like to me, as a YouTube consumer that consumes YouTube a lot, that's used to media, that's just like fast jump cuts, cut out every single breath, cut out everything that feels so slow to me. It feels like a slow motion type of, of lecture video, which is which I think is part of the problem, part of the reason why left and academic type of uh, educational content hasn't caught on yet is because they must pay attention to the aesthetic of the platform that they are on. And if you're going to be on YouTube, then you need to edit your video like if it's on YouTube. And does it take a long time? Yeah. Yeah, because I have to cut, cut every single snippet out. I cut out every single mistake. I cut out every um, every hesitation. If I mess up a line, I'll go back and re-record that line again. So yeah, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot of work, but um, you get really fast as, as you as you as you get as you gain experience editing your own your own talking. That's for sure. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, Vanessa uh, says thank you so much for this amazing talk. I wish your videos were submitted in Spanish as I would love to use them here in Mexico. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, Nadler says, great presentation. Um, uh, what links uh, do you see between creative video essay pedagogical practices and building um, equitable classrooms and higher education? Yeah, that's a... That's an, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I do often kind of wonder if I would take this exact same pedagogical approach live in classrooms. I've, I've really been thinking about it. Like, should I remove all of the academic language even in a live classroom? Um, I would say, well, for one thing, it is absolutely possible. That is fact, it is possible. Whether or not I do it, that I haven't really quite gotten on board yet. Cause, cause you know, I, 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 the videos are tailored and created aesthetically, pedagogically in a certain way. And like I said, that was a lot of it was based off of me being a high school teacher maybe when I start teaching more regularly and have my classes for extended periods of time, maybe I'm going to pull back that high school teacher persona again and just put it straight into the undergrad classroom as well. It, I imagine I'll probably do that, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see how much I, uh, how much I do it. But I will say if, if, more professors were like required to teach in public schools for one or two years. I think their teaching would change quite a bit because they wouldn't be able to pull off what they do in, in you know, in, in higher education. And you try to teach like that to, uh, to high school students, you know, <laughs> it'd be a mistake. You're not going to get very far, not get very far. Right. Um, and I have a question um, I wanted to ask about uh, about money, because you've mentioned that um, you've gotten quite a few grants at this uh, point, right? And some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. But have you like, uh, how many applications? I mean, I'm not asking how many applications have you have you submitted, right? But what is the ratio? So, I mean, it sounded like 
you know, all the process of getting those grants was quite smooth. But what was, uh, how can you describe it in reality? Did it have, how many times approximately have you been turned down by those, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. big? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, uh, I think in total, I've applied for like eight or nine and I've gotten like seven. So it's, it, it, I've gotten most of them. And, and honestly, it's, it's because, like I said, it, there's not very many people uh, doing what I do. Like, let's say, um, there's this grant, there's going to be like 20 people applying for money to get to fund their podcast, because podcasts are very popular right now, right? And then maybe there's going to be me, the one guy trying to do a YouTube channel, and then being able to send in my samples. And I've been doing them for such a long time that they look very professional already. And, and then plus having uh, recommenders that fully believe in the YouTube channel as well big name re recommenders so i think yeah I, I mean i i get most of them most of the time but i think it's because i, I like i don't want to take too much credit away from myself but the fact that there's hardly anybody else trying to do it the competition is very thin right now which is why i, I think if everybody tried to do it tried to get in on some kind of grant action it's very likely that it could be uh, it, it, it could be funded and also getting creative with which grants to go to, for example, journalism, journalism has a whole lot of different grants that are video oriented and things like that. And if you wanted to say like, Hey, I want to do a ethnographic research on whatever using these particular readings or whatever, those are places like that. Like, you know, there's creative ways to get the money in other words. And, and, and there's plenty of money out there that there's, people do want this. They just need more people to do it. Yeah. All right. We have uh, two more minutes and a question from Anne. Um, <laughs> as a former public high school teacher, I uh, saw so myself, I, I can relate to so much of what you have addressed, particularly in terms of uh, changing heavy academic language into language that is more uh, accessible, especially for new English learners. Uh, often um, um, as, as a means of scaffolding information and concepts uh, that they will uh, ultimately be tested on. Thank you. So that was not a question. That was a comment. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, Anne. But scaffolding, yes, scaffolding is in there all the way, all the way through my, through, through, through my approach, definitely. Mm -hmm. If anything, like the video is the scaffold and then, and then they take away the video to go into the actual lecture itself actual text itself so yeah absolutely scaffolding is totally important to me mm -hmm. well uh thank you so much mike it was both very educational and very entertaining right <laughs> so what else do we need <laughs> entertaining so i have to be entertaining that's it just i'm too traumatized from being a high school teacher that to not be entertaining oh boy oh boy yeah, it was, it was really fun being here. Thanks, everyone. Give yourselves a round of applause for listening to me talk for two whole hours. It's one of the longest presentations I've ever done. Two hours in a row. Whew, that's good. <laughs> so thanks, everybody, for your, uh, for your attention span and all that, too.